such a common theme for so many entrepreneurs and achievers. It's kind of like the what now, right? You know, what's on the other side of that thing that you're, you're going so hard after. And I think a lot of high achievers, when they sell the, when they exit or when they get the promotion or become the CEO or get the round of funding, it's like, then there, there's an emptiness because the hole they're trying to fill, there's nothing that, there's no goal line or thing that's going to fill that hole that has to come from within. Right. Been, this is not something that I like intuitively knew. It took a lot of work for me to get to a point where I could really rewire my, 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 you know, my neural pathways could fire a little differently so that I understood like, it's all about the journey and the process and loving that and, and architecting that process so that you're doing the things that feel good, that align with your values, your lifestyle the way you want to live right now and and the outcomes will take care of themselves all right welcome to another episode of the deeper than dope podcast today i have the pleasure of introducing justin me justin thank you for being on the show hey bennett thanks for having me good to be here and we are great friends we've spent Two minutes getting to know each other. <laughs> yes, we go way back, at least 120 seconds. I know that Justin is out of Dallas and he knows I'm out of Salt Lake. So um, anyways, I'm excited to, to get to know you a little bit more, Justin. Can we start with a quick background of uh, who you are? Yeah, my name is Justin Mink. I am an entrepreneurial operating system implementer. I'm a franchisee of EOS, for those of you familiar with the book Traction or EOS gains a lot of popularity within the franchise community over the last several years. I've spent my career as an entrepreneur, founding companies and leadership roles at startups, and then working on the agency side with franchises. So I ran, uh, I ran our franchise division at a couple pretty big digital marketing agencies. That's how I got deeply involved and entrenched and generated so many relationships and friendships within the franchise community. Yeah, I was just looking up the our mutual friends. It was just all franchise people. I know, I know. It's you know, like it's it's a real family, man. Yep, it's, yep. It's, it's, that's that's uh, that's part of the fun of it. So, what did you get involved with uh, with EOS? Well, I I ran EOS, and when I left a big agency uh, called Scorpion, I joined a startup. And uh, you know, on, on my entrepreneurial journey, uh, lots of highs and lows. And as far as the highs are, it's the lows that. You know, they give you the lessons that you can take with you, um, the powerful lessons. So I started up a company in Dallas about 10 years ago. It's a great, great journey. We raised a bunch of money today. That company has over 100 employees and is thriving 10 years later. But I got really sick while I was doing that. I ended up um, getting mono or Epstein-Barr virus. Um, oh. Brutal, right? For an adult, uh, it's kind of a kid thing but when you're an adult working 80 hours. I mean, part of the reason I got sick was because I was working 80 hour weeks and so stressed out. It ruins your immune system. The, the stress. Yeah. I was engaged to be married. I mean, I was just, I was just, just both ends of the candle were completely burned to the nub. And so I got sick. And, and at the time I thought I was down being an entrepreneur because I just didn't have it anymore. I thought it was synonymous with chaos and stress and sacrificing your health and relationships and time for any other passions or interests in your life. So I took a step back from entrepreneurship, got back into enterprise sales with the digital agency, leading another franchise team, not a franchise team, but a team of folks working with franchises as our clients. And then I read the book Traction. Uh, actually, a franchise friend of mine handed it to me and it was inspiring. I was kind of ticked off because I would, I, I had, I had, uh, there were answers to questions I didn't think had answers. You know, it didn't have to be so stressful and so chaotic. Um, but I was more inspired to get back into an entrepreneurial venture. So I joined a little startup agency under the condition that we run the business on EOS. And uh, CEO became a fan after I mailed him a copy of the book. And it was a transformative experience. Our revenue velocity doubled over the course of about a six-month period where it took us to really weave EOS into the fabric of the business. And so, and also we made work-life balance a, a company value and capped everyone's hours a week at 40. Awesome. And this is a guy, the CEO, who's also on that 80-hour grind. Um, 
and, and what was down to working 40 hour weeks while the company doubled in, in revenue. So for me, that was just a transformative experience. I found out EOS was a franchise. So I had the opportunity to become a franchisee. And, and for me, it was kind of like, you know, fate accompli, like the universe telling me that I needed to go help other entrepreneurs, That's you know, cool. uh, do this. You capped your employees at working 40 hours. What did that do for employee well-being and retention? Employee engagement just shot up through the roof. You know, we, we in large part, EOS, a lot of companies that use EOS are thinking about it from a smarter standpoint. How do we get more strategic and better communication and process and efficiency. But there's also a massive component of creating healthy, you know, dynamic, great culture, cohesive teams that work well together and, you know, lack of ego and politics. And so that company's engagement went through the roof and it's landed on best places to work lists over the last several years, uh, Inc. 5000, you know, acknowledgement. So it, it, it did wonders for employee engagement. That's awesome. And, and let me try to summarize. I don't know a ton about a US. Um, it's a management style, uh, similar vocabulary uh, as far as how meetings should be ran, uh, terminology, what are what are the rocks, the issues. Uh, so it's, it's really bringing in everything so everybody can speak the same language, um, set the same types of goals with the same types of um, uh, accountability. Is, is that a decent summary? How would you summarize it? Yeah, I mean, for someone who doesn't know a lot about it, you just you 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 encapsulated it pretty pretty elegantly there. You I mean, to implement it. That's why. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a simple set of practical tools. You know, that's it. Um, and designed to get everyone aligned on where the company's going and how how you're going to get there together, creating that cohesive, compelling vision, creating traction so that there's discipline and accountability. And everyone's rowing in the same direction. All the human energy in the company's harnessed, so everyone's marching forward lockstep together towards the achievement of the vision and creating healthy teams, like I said before, where there's just, you know, how do we get better together and no blame and no ego and and just open and honest, vulnerable team. So it's, and it's just a simple set of tools that, like you said, that provides context and language for everyone to work within those guidelines and, and that framework. Yeah. I have a good buddy that's an implementer and I really mm-hmm. wanted to start implementing US. So it was last December, so 13 months ago. I had him come and he did like a presentation and we have our franchise company, but we also have our food manufacturing company that also uses their own. Uh, I mean, it's a completely separate uh, company and inventory management system. And anyways, and then we also have the logistics side and then we run corporate stores. I'm like, I need something to bring everything together. Fortunately, it didn't happen at that time. We just brought on a new CEO and management group. Um, and I just started talking to him about it. I was like, I really like, I sold my solar company and maybe it's been about two and a half years. The company that bought it was uh, doing EOS. I probably went to two meetings and then I just left <laughs> and I, I focused full time on Dirty Dome. Um, yeah. But I thought it was really cool because especially in the startup, I mean, there's just so much going on. You need something to come back and you need to speak the same language. Like anyway, so I, I think it's super cool and I need to, uh, again, I just asked the new CEO. He's only been on for a month now. Um, I looked at that, so I didn't. I didn't know that it was a franchise. Um, yeah, yeah. It 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 became a franchise about three years ago. It was like a licensed member model for the majority of the the life of the company. And I love that that you that you've hit on the, the same language value there because that's really for franchises. That's a big part of the the power of EOS is that for a distributed system. That is the very definition and nature of a franchise to, to, it, to push EOS out to all the franchisees and have everyone speak in the same language. It's really incredibly powerful for, for, for a scaling franchise to have that, that, that shared context and framework that everyone can work off of. It, it makes conversations much more efficient where people can automatically kind of know what each other's talking about and share best practices and experience from the same playbook. That's a really cool element. So I love that you keep saying the same language because that's that's and huge for a franchise. Part of it as well is recognizing who you are, right? I, I, I think it's that the visionary and the integrator, that terminology also comes from EOS and understanding which type of person each person is, and then you can put them in the right seat of the bus. I think that is super valuable as well. Um, a, a question for you that I'd like two answers on, one from you personally, one from the um, viewpoint of the EOS, but just talking 
what is success? Um, like what is success to Justin? What is success to EOS? Well, it's, it's, you know, I think the answer is one and the same and it's freedom for me. Yeah. Freedom for myself and ultimately helping others experience freedom. You know, I think for me, EOS was such came at such an important time in my life where I'd been struggling with that illness to one degree or another for like a decade. Oh. And and man, then we could spend probably four hours talking about yeah, you know, like like most people with chronic stuff, all the modalities and therapies and just like the dead ends and feeling lost and like nobody understood or could help and and it was like being in prison almost, you know, and, and and like all entrepreneurs, the things that once served me and like drove my passion and fuel also were some of my worst traits, right? Some of the things that tanked me uh -huh. and that, uh, you know, caused frustration and in some cases even despair. So, and just uh, hopelessness and going harder and harder at, because that's the only way I knew how to be without stopping to reflect and explore what was driving me and how to keep those things that gave me energy and push away the things that maybe didn't serve me any longer. So, you know, EOS creates freedom for leaders and teams. Um, it frees up leaders to be leaders and not have to be consumed by the business to actually kind of take control. And for me, uh, it's allowed me to live a life that I feel like I am in control of my life. I'm in control of my mindset. I'm in control of my energy. So I, there's no way for me to separate personal and professional because that's a big reason why I got into this it is to create, to, to architect the kind of freedom I want in my life and to be in a position to help others experience that too. Okay. And then you're talking freedom. Is this time freedom mixed with some financial freedom? Is that? So it's, so I have, my 10 year target for those of you who are no EOS, that's like the BHAG, right? Big Harry Audacious goal, your number one goal. For me, it's, it's, um, so we use a criteria of strength, we call it, of 80% plus strong. It's just one of the criteria we use to evaluate for, for EOS businesses to assess how strong they are as an organization. So for me, 80% is like the, 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 the bar for excellence. It's professional, 80% plus strong financial, prof professional financial and, and physical independence. And for me, independence and freedom mean the same thing. So I want to have the freedom to, to live the kind of physical life I want, get on a bike, go to the gym, hit the, hit the slopes, do a hike. I want to be able to make the decisions professionally and, and in my personal life where I just don't feel constrained in any capacity I like in that. life. Have you yeah. taken the time? One, I, I like that you know your 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 B hack, big audacious. What is, is that? Big hairy audacious big goal. Hairy, yeah, audacious goal. Okay. Jim Collins, good to great. That, yeah, you, that you've taken the time to do that, and I don't think most people have. Have you taken your time to even go? Okay, like once I achieve my goal, what does that life look look like? I, I remember I did that with one of the Tony Robbins books forever ago, uh, which which was amazing, and, and I I do think that most people. We don't set any goals. And then the few goals we set, it's kind of, okay, I'm going to hit, hit this goal. And then even if I hit perfect time freedom, what is my life look like at that point? And, and really what I'm getting at before I let you answer it is there's a, there's a, a story. I don't know. I've heard it a, a thousand different ways, but some businessman goes to Cabo and he goes fishing. You know, you so said you're not in your head. You know the story. Um, <clears throat> hey, why don't you, you know, they go have a great fish, fishing trip, or whatever. And the businessman is like selling this fisherman, like, Hey, why don't you go get, more boats. Why do I need more boats? He's like, so you can catch more fish. Why do I need to catch more fish? So then you can sell them at the market and then you can get even more boats and you can have this empire and, and this fishing empire. It's like, yeah, but why would I want all that? So you could do whatever you want every day. He goes, I already do that. <laughs> so a lot of the times, um, I, I do think that's like that freedom. One exercise that I, that's really helped me and I've looked by is like, if I was living my perfect life, what would I do on a daily basis? I would, go on daddy daughter dates every day. And I would go to the gym and I would spend time with my wife. I would do date nights on Friday. And then I just thought, what's stopping me from doing all of those today? And most days I do do it. So anyways, that, that, that's been a really good activity for me. I'd lo love to kind of hear your thoughts on that. that. That's beautiful, man. I mean, I, you just hit uh, a, 
such a common theme for so many entrepreneurs and achievers. It's kind of like the what now, right? You know, what's on the other side of that thing that you're, you're going so hard after. And I think a lot of high achievers, when they sell, the, when they exit or when they get the promotion or become the CEO or get the round of funding, it's like, then there, there's an emptiness because the hole they're trying to fill, there's nothing that, there's no goal line or thing that's going to fill that hole that has to come from within. Right. So, you know, for me, I it's, and it's been, this is not something that I like intuitively knew. It took a lot of work for me to get to a point where I could really rewire my, 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 you know, my neural pathways could fire a little differently so that I understood like, it's all about the journey and the process and loving that and, and architecting that process so that you're doing the things that feel good, that align with your values, your lifestyle, the way you want to live right now. And, and the outcomes will take care of themselves. Yep. So I'm not a goal. I'm, it sounds kind of weird to say it. Personally, I do have my goals and I, my, I have a family vision traction organizer. My wife and I have put together the vision of our family within kind of an EOS framework, but I'm more concerned with how I live my life day to day, putting, doing the right things and knowing that on the other side of that is going to come all the good stuff. Yeah. Right. But at the same time, you can have a lot of the, the skiing trips. I mean, you can, uh, I, I, we'll dive into the health a little bit more, but assuming you're healthy, um, you can, you can start doing skiing trips, you know, a few times a year or whenever you want. And, and that's where I like, I guess your response is how, how do you, I don't invite everybody to that. Like, what is your perfect life? What do you do on a day-to-day basis? How many of the, those things can you do? Like, can you actually do day-to-day? And you probably can do a lot of them or at least on a monthly basis, at least on an annual basis. And then you could start weaving in, but the work for the, your whole life, retire at age 65. And then, and then <laughs> and then right. you enjoy your life. You're going to be bored as hell probably. Nobody really wants to to retire, especially if they don't really have have all their help. Um, so, anyways, but you know what, Bennett? That that takes intention, right? And so, it takes stepping outside of that tyranny of the urgent, chaotic, reactive swirl that most busy folks live in. Busy professionals really asking yourself some questions, answering those questions, and then architecting your life and the decisions you make to support the answers to those questions. But that takes a lot of intention and work. It does. I'm, this was my, my personal journey was I did have an exit from a solar company, got a lot of dopamine, felt great. And then I realized, <laughs> oh, I'm just working. And I just set my next goal. Like within two weeks, I set my next goal. And I was like, wow. I'm going to start working again, nights and weekends, everything. And then I started seeing, so that kind of was the catalyst to then tell me that I needed to seek help with what the hell's going on in my mind and like what drives me. So I started seeing a therapist and then I got into a lot of drugs, but like psychedelic drugs, yeah. which was like the best thing ever. So whether it was, I, I, I tried uh, mushrooms, MDMA, ketamine's legal, which is awesome. Yeah. And like therapeutic ketamine. And that you, you, you talked about rewiring the neurons in your brain, which I mean, now we actually have ketamine prescribed to me. I can go upstairs, in my house, you take a little thing, you put it on your tongue and it blocks your GABA receptors, which is required for your brain to think. So if those are blocked for you to have the same thought process, you, it forces your brain to rewire. And that has been just so, so healthy. Because if you look at any, really anything in life, uh, especially any negative, whether it's stress or anger, uh, shame, guilt, you can always look at it in a different point of view. Like I'm angry because somebody cut me off. And then I look at a different point of view. Maybe that person's kid just got in a car wreck and is in the hospital or rushing to the hospital, right? If I, am I able to look at it in a different point of view, then I can release that anger. And that for me, again, it was like I had to achieve, see that it wasn't enough, go get help from a therapist. I hired a business coach and then I started doing psychedelics as well. And all of that kind of combined led me to a completely different trajectory in life. Um, and I would ask you the same, what was it and and how did you, uh, I guess, start going down that pathway of, hey, I, I need to shift my thinking and start rewiring my brain? Yeah, man. Oh, well, it sounds like you and I have had somewhat similar journeys. You know, I, I, I've, I've had all these physical symptoms for many, many years that have come and go to one degree of, of intensity or you know, to the, uh, at times debilitating degree and 
chronic fatigue and some some gut issues that uh, caused me to lose so much weight and just cascading series of cr chronic stuff. And um, I finally sort of uh, intellectually understood around the mind body and how the mind and how Western medicine in a lot of cases fails patients because it's so specialized. And so if you're, if your knee, if your tummy hurts, let's just look at your tummy and your brain is a part of your body and yet it's treated as this thing yep. that exists outside of in some other galaxy, which is just a fallacy. But all of our Western medicine is, is essentially stacked against that mind body uh, modality. So I started going down that path, exploring EMDR therapy, um, which brought up a lot, brought up a well of depression and anxiety. And for me, ketamine was a huge catalyst. You know, the first time I got a ketamine infusion, mm -hmm. the next day I woke up and it was like being released from a prison of my own mind. I mean, I, I was like, all my chronic fatigue was gone. It was, it was a profound overnight experience. It's close to damn near a religious experience for me. And so that made me really lean into my body. And ever since I, went from intellectually understanding it to fully internalizing it. It's like, you know, you don't, you don't see God until you believe God, right? You have to believe it first. And when you believe it, that's when it unfolds for you. So that was about a year ago from even less. And that was like, that was an inflection point where everything started to change for me. It was ketamine. Awesome. Do you, do you yeah. go back and, and typically it's a six treatment over three to four weeks. So you're doing it once or twice a week. Uh, and then recently, like I was saying before, you can get prescribed a nasal spray or a trochee. You could do it once a week, once a month, whatever you want to do. Um, and then you don't, I mean, for me, it's just one, it costs a few hundred bucks to go get an IV. And then you have to have somebody with you. So my wife would come and that means we also have to have a babysitter. And it was just like a horror ordeal. So I'm very grateful that they're, that it's adapting that you can do it at home. Um, have you gone back to do ketamine more times? Do you feel like it's needed or do you feel like what you have was enough? Yeah. So I, so there's some clinics here in Dallas. I found one that had really good reviews. I actually talked to another franchise guy in the community I found who left him a review. I won't say his name because it's, you know, it could be a private matter for some, but he helped me and, and gave these guys a ringing endorsement. And so I did the first initial six infusions over the course of, I think, four weeks. And then I, then uh, I did a couple follow-ups and it's, it's supposed to have more and more enduring yeah. uh, impact the, the more you do it and you can get further between sessions. So for me, I've just done eight and I have prescribed nasal spray too, but I've only had to use it a couple times. And, and I've been from a, from a depression and anxiety standpoint, I mean, I have to, and plus all the work I do with a weekly therapist and just the, yeah. the work I do on myself I've been good. I haven't had to go back in many, many months. I'm hoping that's a permanent awesome. thing. But if it's not, I know there's another tool out there that really works and is effective. Yeah, I got the nasal spray too. Um, and it's prescribed, I think it's once every seven minutes, one spray nasal nostril every seven minutes, you get five times in a row. So it's 35 minutes. For whatever reason, I, I don't love it. Um, I like the, the, the trochee better. But I do like to spray if I'm feeling uh, massive amounts of stress or anxiety to do just one spray, like even right now between a podcast, it's enough to just barely feel it, but it's, I don't know, kind of brings me back down and, and it's yeah. and really a, a, an amazing tool. Um, can we, if you're comfortable with it, can we dive into your help and kind of what that was like? Obviously physically it's really hard, but talk about the mental aspect of, of having a, you know, chronic, uh, pain and like Mentally, what do you tell yourself? Like, why is this happening to me? That's that's very easy to go there, and you can go there. You should go there, probably. Um, anyways, I, I just love to hear on the mental aspect of like, my family doesn't have this, my friends don't have this. Why am I dealing with this, and how do you get over that? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm a like a lot of entrepreneurs, and I'm sure folks who listen to your your show and your audience, I'm pretty hard charging. So I went after my illness, like I will I go after everything. I just like went hard. Um, you know, I spent nine days at the Mayo Clinic. I went to a fasting clinic twice. The longest I, I went without eating solid food was nine days. Wow. I'm a pretty skinny dude. I lost about 15 pounds. I look like the machinist Christian Bale in that movie. Um, 
and I've explored and you name the modality, Western, Eastern and all things in between. I've, I've explored it, but honestly, man, I, 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 I realized that going so hard after it was actually not a good thing uh-huh. cause it was, I was so intense and the intensity and the way I'm wired was in large part what led me down the path to begin with. So I had to kind of ease off a little and take a more, uh, equanimity equanimity approach. I had to become like, just chill about it and curious versus desperate Uh and, and slow and steady and sort of start understanding that this wasn't just about finding some magic pill because that doesn't exist is as effective as ketamine and some of these other therapies are, there's no red pill. Right. So I had to, come to grips at one, it's a mind, body, spirit, you know, mental thing. And all of that has to coalesce and work together in concert and take a much more sort of long game approach where I realize that healing is not a linear thing. It's very lumpy and an up and down journey. And once I kind of embraced those, that mindset, that's when things started to really change for me. Yeah. Um, I like that a lot. And that's, Something that I get into a lot, yeah, especially if I'm like on a ketamine trip or journey, is I'll throw in some headphones and and, and uh, what I gravitate to now the most is Buddhist philosophy. Uh, there is no control, like let it go, stop trying to control everything. Because when you start, like I'm smiling as you're like, I went after it. I'm like, that's how I am. You know, like I have something, I'm just going to boom, 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 I'm going to try everything. When I started trying everything, it actually made things worse. It... it when I'm like, I have too much stress, I have too much anxiety, so I'm going to try everything. And then if I tried mushrooms, let's say that everybody has these amazing experiences on mushrooms. I had, I freaking wanted to kill myself on mushrooms. And that was like even more depressing because I'm like, wait, this is supposed to help me and it's not. So the more things I tried that were supposed to help me, but didn't give me the help that I, the expectation of the help that I wanted, that was even worse because I'm like, oh, I'm getting, nothing's working, you know? Uh, and then when I, started focusing on the philosophy and the mindset part of it. Uh, it's really just what we label it. Um, and we can label it anxiety. We can label it stress. But well, how about we stop labeling stress bad and anxiety bad? It's just, it is what it is, right? There's there, And that's kind of what I've learned from the, the Buddhist YouTube videos <laughs> that I listen to is it's just experience. It's just experience and everything is perspective. Um, so you know what? Um, I, I just want to hit on something you said there. There was an experience I had during a ketamine treatment where, and, and I don't know, ketamine, it's a hard thing to describe if you haven't experienced it because you're, you're, it does some weird things to your, your mind. Yeah. You are like in a million places at once, but it, it's sort of, I have had anxiety issues and like, I had this experience where one part of me was freaking out and about to have a panic attack. And the other was watching and like observing totally objectively, like some guy watching, like watching it happen on a movie screen. And it made me realize that my anxiety, anyone's anxiety or depression or anything you're going through is not you. It's just this thing that is not who you are. And like, there's a book called the untethered soul that I read by Michael Singer throughout the experience. And it really, I mean, it's all about presence and mindfulness and, the fact that all of these, all of this is happening around us and we're just like just observers. observers, observers of it all. And and that's, you know, if you take that approach, it takes the, it takes the negative energy, the negative charge out of everything. And you can sort of have that, that even, you know, peace. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a, a different thought, but this is my current belief. My blue star is changing, but if we can imagine a world of robots, right? If, if everybody's a robot and you're acting towards programming, do robots get angry with each other? Do they have, do they feel guilt? Do they feel shame? Um, do they punish one another? You know, no, they, they wouldn't. So if you look at ourselves and you just pay attention to your thoughts and I do a lot of, you know, meditation. And I think this is very evident for anybody who just takes, whether it's five minutes or five minutes times 50 times, just pay attention and, and see if you can control your thoughts. See if you know what you're going to think before the thought arises. And the answer emphatically is no. We have no control over our thoughts. It is a weird, everybody gets mad when I say this. Just go try it. Pay attention to your thoughts and think. Can I think 
what I'm going to think before I think it. And 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 obviously it's a stupid question because the answer is in there. You, you don't know what the thoughts are until they just arise. But what that is an indicator of for me is there is no control. It's exactly what you're saying. We're just observers. So whether it's a thought or whether it's an action or whether it's an emotion, um, we don't control it. We're just observing it. And that's, that's it. And then you can detach yourself from that and you can live a life when you remember this free of guilt, free of shame, free of pride of look at me, you look what I've done. It's just like, no, I've done good or bad because that was the hand that I was dealt. But you can still have an immense and uh, an immense and unlimited amount of gratitude of just, wow, I'm alive. Like, what are the chances are that I'm alive? Like, not even one in a billion. And you can just sit back and say, I'm, I'm grateful for the hand I was dealt and I'm grateful that I am allowed to have this experience. And then you can leave all of that negative emotion aside. And again, this is getting at, there's no libertarian free will, but for me, it's been very free. I'm, I'm with you. And it's, it's, I think the common misperception that people have around meditation and mindfulness is that, oh, it's woo woo. And I'm fine. I'm letting my, my mind go free and I can't do it. And it's boring. And I, there's no way I could sit and relax and I don't buy into it. And that's not what it's about. It's about observing your thoughts realizing that you have no control over them and then being selective about the ones that you choose to pay attention to and believe and the ones you choose to let 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 go by you like you're in a car watching trees go by. Yep. And so many of us dwell, we stop the car and stare at one freaking tree and it's a doom loop and then we drive around the tree and it keeps us up all night. Yep. And when you when you get good and become second nature, we learn to let it all pass by us, and and we're just sitting in a car taking a ride and grateful for the journey. And that that's the power and the real value of mindfulness versus the woo woo, you know, Zen stuff that some people think it is. Yeah, and, and I think that is, people think it's that because they've never tried it. I mean, because that's what I thought it was. I I mean, I thought therapy was that as like emotions, talk about emotions, and then you think about it logically. Like I'm a logical guy. Why do I want money? Why do I want success? Why do I want recognition? Why do I want, it all comes down to an emotion. So why the hell am I not focused on and talking about myself and to somebody else about myself, about my emotions? Like, why am I talking to a business coach about money when I don't really want money? I want an emotion. So isn't it better to talk to somebody who's going to teach me how to get that emotion and recognize that emotion, go after that emotion? Because before that, again, I'm like, look, therapy, emotions, Men don't do that, you know. So it was just right. a different mindset. And once I saw that, I'm like, man, dang it. Why well, I wish I could have gotten into this earlier, but I'm grateful that I'm into it now. Uh yeah. Yeah. I mean, we all have these like most people and, and I include myself among them, is there's a great line from from the untethered soul that always stuck with me and that that we've got these thorns stuck in us. And most people live their lives with this elaborate architecture to keep that thorn from being touched. So, you know, you'll create this whole sleeping mechanism so that you could sleep so that the thorn doesn't get pushed on. And, you know, if you go on a walk, you'll clear everything around so that the thorn doesn't get touched. And meanwhile, just like you said, dealing with your emotions is like taking the thorn and removing it from your body, right? It hurts when you tear it out, but then it's gone. It's processed. And, and I'm with you, man. Like, I think, there's this free will debate, but I think we're all to one degree or another. I, I wouldn't call it autom automatons or robots, but we are governed by things that we don't even, we're not even aware of. And being conscious of that and aware of that and observant of that can, can change your whole career and your whole life. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, de it definitely has for me. Um, and just again, looking at things in a different perspective. I mean, I've been playing with this pen. It's like, okay, well, what is this? To me and you, you know, you, it's a pen, but if I zoom in a hundred times, then it's no longer a pen. It's just white plastic, right? If I'm, if I'm only looking at that, it's just white plastic. If I continue to zoom in, maybe I go past the plastic and now I'm into the ink and now it's just ink and you keep zooming in from there and it's no longer ink. It's a, it's a molecule. And then you zoom in from there. And if that's all I'm seeing, if I'm a hundred thousand times zoomed in, I'm not seeing a pen. I'm not seeing ink. I'm not seeing plastic. I'm seeing an atom maybe. And same goes if I go the reverse. You know, I'm not seeing a pen, I'm seeing a house. I'm seeing a city, I'm seeing a world. And it's like anything that we see is only perspective. It's only the perspective that that we place on, which is just like, okay, well then how can I change my perspective? Um, 
And then I changed my whole experience. So anyways, yeah. and that's been super helpful for me. I appreciate your shared experience. Uh, last question for you is what is the legacy and uh, that you want to leave behind and how do you want to be remembered? Man, I feel like I've been through hell and back. I've been at the gates that, the gates of hell. I mean, uh, when you're in that kind of pain for so long, nobody can really ever understand it. But we all search. I mean, for me, it's been important to find meaning in it. And for me, it's made me the person I am. I probably would have had these low level issues my whole life had had the the universe not forced me to confront some really tough things and be and wake up to those things and deal with them in a way that was healthy and sustainable. So I want to leverage my experience to help others. And, and, and if, if I could leave a handful of people that say hey, that guy helped me, you know, find freedom in my own life and help me live the life that, that is authentically aligned with why I'm here and, and doing the things I can do to express and manifest that in a way that's authentic. Like that's all I could ask for. I love that. And, and, I, and I can imagine that the business that you've chosen helps you align with that a lot because entrepreneurship for a lot of people, I mean, it is life, right? Is there, it's their well being and their, their ego, who they are. And if you can allow them to step back and say, stop working 80 hours or 40 hours and you can achieve more with less and you can give them their, their freedom. Um, again, that it aligns exactly up with what, with what, how you want to remember. So, so I love that. Um, last thing, Justin, how do listeners connect with you? Thanks for asking. Uh, you can look me up on LinkedIn, Justin, uh, Justin Mink. I'm on LinkedIn all, I'm just like all, all day. I post, uh, about EOS mindset. I have an executive coaching practice. So a lot of mindset leadership tidbits, uh, you can sign up for my newsletter. I send a, a, a little practical one minute or less insight every day called Mink in a Minute. So you can find me or you can find me on my website, eosworldwide.com forward slash Justin dash Mink. Okay. Justin, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you so much, Ben. It was fun.